So good morning and welcome. I'm uh, Frank Verastra. I'm a senior vice president at CSIS, and I'm director of the Energy and National Security Program, and it's certainly my pleasure to uh, introduce our speakers this morning. We've had a series over the last several months on the offshore uh, events uh, from the summer, um, and we expect to continue that into next spring. We have bios of our two speakers today, but uh, let me just tell you first that uh, Robin West, I've known for quite some time, and, and Robin is a distinguished speaker um, and a good friend. He was former Secretary of the Interior that was responsible for offshore drilling. He's now the chairman and founder of PFC Energy and the chairman of the Institute for Peace, just to show how well-rounded he is. We've asked Robin to talk about this morning the implications, uh, the impact of offshore drilling, what it means to the world and to the U.S., and some of the implications on how we go forward. I'm also extremely pleased that we have with us this morning Magna Ogdendal. He's the director of the uh, safety group in Norway, and we've heard a lot about safety case and different regulatory structures. And one of the things we want to talk about is how the U.S. goes forward. How do we make things safer, still have economically viable, so that we can continue to produce, and how quick can we do that, given the situation that we have in the United States? So let me just set up with a few slides here. Thank you all for coming. Um, the session, we will have it available on our website with permission of our speakers, uh, Robin, that will post these slides on our website as well. And let's get started. So today's event is the third, actually, in a series of offshore events that we've held, all of which are available on the CSIS website. We have two upcoming events that we'd like to talk to you about, though. November 16th in the evening, we're having Admiral Allen talk about the uh, Joint Command, uh, what was right and what went wrong during the Gulf oil spill. And then on the 13th of January, we have Director uh, Bromwich from the Interior Department, who's going to come and speak to us. We also plan to do a session on the Arctic, and I want to talk to Magna a little bit about that, because I think the Arctic is a different set of circumstances. There's been a lot of discussion on, on safety case versus the kind of prescriptive regulations that we have in the United States. And while Norway's situation isn't exactly a safety case, they do put a lot of emphasis on what companies do um, to uh, look at the implications, uh, look at the hazards and preventative measures at the beginning, and then also lay out your contingency plans for what if, the what if situation that if something were to go wrong. Um, this assumes that there's a lot of trust between the regulators and the operating companies to do that. And so it's a very different set of circumstances that we have in the United States. It's also different in the way that we approach things in terms of our regulatory structure here. So when people talk about this gradual move in that direction, it'll be quite a while before we actually see that implemented or something like that in the United States, but it may be a laudable goal. So with that, let me turn you over to our first speaker this morning. I'm asking uh, Robin West to come up and talk to you about the implications of the Gulf spill and how we go forward. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I was getting worried. I thought Frank was going to give my speech here, which is always a, at 9.30 in the morning on a Monday can be a <clears throat> not a good start to the week. Um, my topic is international regulatory approaches, um, and I think that uh, it's one of the things as we think through uh, the whole question of, of uh, how to manage the offshore, uh, I think there's some very important lessons which we can learn from others. But before I begin, I, I want to thank Frank and CSIS. Um, uh, there has been a lot of noise and heat and hot air on this subject since the Macondo blowout. And um, uh, I think CSIS has played a virtually unique role uh, in trying to uh, inform this debate. And the series of uh, sessions they've had have been very substantive. Uh, as I say, I've tried to inform the debate. This is a complicated subject, um, which if you uh, are engaged in it, it's complicated enough, and if you're not, it's mind-numbing. Uh, but it's starting to dawn on people that this is actually a big deal. I mean, one of the questions is most people are shocked at how big a deal the U.S. offshore industry really is. Um, offshore, we produce about 23% of our oil and 10% of our natural gas. Um, in the United States, in Alaska, um, uh, production, oil production is declining. Onshore, oil production is declining. On the shelf, oil production is declining. Uh, and deep water uh, production is declining. It's only in the ultra deep water uh, that production um, 
uh, is moving up and it's actually surging at about 15% a year. And that's, that's an enormous amount. So this is important. It's also very important economically. This is one of the largest and most efficient industries in the United States. Um, it, uh, we estimate that direct and indirect, it's about $100 billion a year. It employs over 400,000 people. One of the examples I like to use is, uh, is helicopters, uh, which are very active offshore. Um, and uh, the helicopter uh, industry, or the, the offshore industry, is the largest purchaser of helicopters after the military. Helicopters are not built in Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana. They're not built on the Gulf Coast. They're built in places like Connecticut and Pennsylvania. And you have compressors. Uh, this is an industry which is one of the largest users of, of uh, uh, data processing of any industry in the world. Um, and uh, so even Silicon Valley. This is a very, very high-tech industry. It's one of the most capital-intensive industries in the world. So the stakes are very big. And the stakes are big from an energy security standpoint, but also in terms of the economy as a whole. Um, and if, if policymakers get this wrong in this country, the, the cost, as I say, from both a general economic as well as an energy security standpoint can be very, very significant. Um, where is uh, most uh, offshore oil produced? Deep water is really uh, in the Golden Triangle, which is North America, um, SS Africa, which is Sub-Saharan Africa, um, and Latin America. Um, North America is the Gulf of Mexico. Um, Latin America is uh, um, Brazil, and Sub-Saharan Africa is West Africa, Nigeria and Angola and those places. Um, so that's, that's really where it's going on. Um, uh, that being said, some of the most sophisticated uh, uh, places in the world with the most experience are places like the North Sea, Norway, and uh, 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 the UK, which have had a lot of experience, and we'll talk about that experience today. Um, and you also have uh, uh, quite an active and growing offshore operation in Australia, uh, which is primarily natural gas. Now, if you look at this, um, the, uh, uh, you have offshore and you have deep offshore. And the challenges of the deep water uh, are really quite different than um, just offshore production, shallow water depth. And you can see that, um, the, uh, uh, the, that, the, that North America plays a key role here, um, and that also that um, the offshore uh, uh, is the key element of, of oil production um, in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and in Europe, it's very little produced onshore. Um, so you can see that different countries um, have different challenges, and you'll see they've approached things quite differently. Now, one of the things is that over the years, there have been a number of very serious accidents. Two accidents that actually aren't on this were uh, two accidents occurred in Norway, um, the second of which led to the imposition of, of blowout preventers um, quite some time ago. Um, in the United States, there was the Santa Barbara blowout, um, which led to an offshore ban for a number of years off California. Um, and it really was a national trauma. Uh, and it, it, it uh, frankly, um, uh, it created a, a deep hostility uh, in A, in California, B, in coastal communities as a whole, uh, with the exception of the Gulf, um, in the environmental community. Um, uh, Santa Barbara was a, a very important event in the perception of this industry over the years. A far bigger spill was the spill in Mexico, Ixtoc, um, which uh, you'll see question marks, what were the consequences? We don't really know. The Mexicans didn't do anything. Um, and interestingly enough, uh, oil flowed uh, from the Mexican portion of the Gulf into the U.S. portion of the Gulf, but the U.S. really didn't do anything either. Um, we had the Exxon Valdez, uh, OPA uh, uh, 1990 came through. Um, a number of laws were changed, changing liability um, and um, requirement of double hull tankers. For the purposes of discussion today, um, really I think the most important event was the one in the UK, uh, which was Piper Alpha. Um, 167 people were killed. This was a production platform, not a drilling rig. Um, this was an oxy, um, that was the operator, um, and um, um, uh, it was a, a huge disaster at the time. 
uh, enormous liabilities, uh, and it led to a really transformation of how the British, um, and I think how a lot of people started thinking about it. And we'll come back to this, but this, this is the event, if you want to understand um, sort of modern offshore regulation and where I think it's heading, it really goes back to Piper Alpha. You then had events in Brazil and Australia and now Macondo. Uh, you'll see here on Macondo, um, one thing that is different than any other country that's had a disaster before um, has been a moratorium. Um, and uh, everybody else proceeded um, uh, with uh, their offshore programs. Uh, admittedly, that there was a lot of scrutiny, but um, it went ahead. In the United States, um, uh, we declared the moratorium in the shallow water as well as the deep water. Um, although, really, the, the challenges of deep water are very different than shallow water. Um, now, there are really a number of different approaches, and if you go back to uh, what happened in Piper Alpha, um, Lord Cullen, who was a, a, a UK judge, um, um, uh, went through and uh, uh, looked at the UK system, and he came to the conclusion that having tired uh, kind of inspectors with clipboards climbing all over platforms looking to make sure valves were right or something was really not the way to do it. Um, and that what happened is that um, they, uh, they turned the whole system around. And it's a system which is very different from our system, which is prescriptive, where still the, the industry has a series of boxes to check, and if you check the boxes, you have complied. Under safety case, it works, as I say, differently. The burden is placed on the operator and on the service providers who work with the operator. And the operator is challenged to demonstrate that they've anticipated all of the problems uh, that could potentially lead to an accident. Um, this is very different than just saying, we've checked the box, you asked us to do, we're all right. Instead, the burden is on the companies to think through and anticipate what the problems are um, and to keep anticipating. It becomes a, a learning experience if, if there's experience on other operations, either that company's or another company, they're supposed to uh, um, go through it um, uh, and think it through and anticipate the problems. And likewise, um, under safety case in the UK system, every five years you have to, to uh, uh, up, update uh, the safety case. Um, the, um, um, the slide got a little screwed up, I see. Um, but at any rate, um, yeah, I, I've got a copy here. Um, the, um, uh, the, the, the key thing under safety case is that um, it's um, a couple points. Operators, one, must prove they have identified the risks, designed equipment and procedures accordingly, and can respond to accidents, emergencies. Uh, the regulators approve and verify the compliance with the company um, identified safety cases uh, with varying degrees of intrusiveness. Now, one of the points, uh, certain companies that have good relations with the regulator, they don't actually produce reports like the New York City telephone book. Um, uh, sometimes it's uh, if they have the trust and confidence of the regulator and the regulator believes that the companies really understand. Um, again, it's not a vast uh, uh, sort of reporting process. Uh, but what they want to do, as they say, is shift the burden to the companies. Um, and companies have to prove they are trusted. They have to earn the trust of the regulator. And this is an approach um, uh, which is taken in Norway, the UK, Australia, Canada, and Brazil, more or less. Now, I'm quick to point out uh, that uh, uh, Norway does not have a formal safety case uh, method. It's, that's a, it's a term of art, but in terms of a sort of mindset and approach to how you manage it. Again, the American system, which is um, uh, a much more prescriptive system, regulators play a more active role. They set the requirements for operators and create a standard. Um, operating plans, environmental impact statements must still be submitted and approved, but the burden is largely on the regulator. Um, and uh, this is a system, however, uh, which uh, uh, permits can go more quickly, um, which is important. Uh, this is the approach that's taken in the United States, China, Indonesia, and Malaysia. Finally, self-regulation. Uh, this is countries with minimal government capacity um, or just growing oil and gas sectors and the regulators lack the experience and resources to play a robust role. 
Um, in these environments, the companies largely regulate themselves. And surprise, surprise, these companies are often national champions, the national oil company of these company, countries. Uh, and this is the case in Mexico with Pemex, uh, Angola, Nigeria, and Ghana. Um, now, if you look here, um, again, countries approach it differently. They take different paths. Um, the regulators reflect the relationship in each state between the political system and the economic policy making. Um, one of the points that uh, the offshore industry in countries like Norway and the UK and Australia and Brazil, these are huge, these are national industries. Um, and how you regulate them is a, a source of national debate and is highly visible, much more so than in the United States. Um, under safety case, the government has the capacity to set and enforce regulations. Um, societies demands for regulation and oversight. They set a high standard. In Norway, they don't want any screw-ups, and there's hell to pay if there are. Um, and um, quite frankly, there's more skepticism of the private sector. Um, and um, um, the, as I say, the burden is on the private sector, private sector to earn trust. Under the prescriptive system, the U.S. system particularly, was a focus on efficiency, um, avoiding delays, and frankly, there's a higher risk tolerance. Uh, and self-regulation, again, it's weak government capacity, um, very strong, very influential, often state enterprises, um, and where the government and the private sector work very closely together. Um, but again, this is a dynamic process. Um, one of the things I think that is very important to keep in mind is if you look at uh, the offshore, it's dawning on people. Um, uh, I think this notion that the Minerals Management Service was a, you know, somehow sort of corrupt buddy system with the industry, I don't think that's fair. But um, I do think um, it's unrealistic to ask, uh, frankly, uh, GS-12s or GS-14s on the Gulf Coast of Mississippi to be regulating one of the most complex, capital-intensive, advanced industries on Earth. Uh, when a single platform can cost $5 billion, and you know, they're just a handful of, as I say, of GS-14s or 12s or something who are trying to do this, it's simply beyond them. Um, and I think why safety case is interesting and is where we should end up um, is uh, that um, the, um, uh, uh, we cannot ask government, and I would argue whether it's in the regulating the offshore industry or regulating the securities industry or some of these other industries where there are enormous stakes of great complexity, enormous amounts of money are involved, and some of the smartest, most sophisticated people in the world um, are, uh, um, uh, frankly, on the private sector side. I think it's very important to harness them um, to uh, participate in this. Um, my last slide is really just kind of summarizing. Um, um, uh, we believe it's very important to look at what a government and safety regulation is trying to achieve and how it reflects the capacities and priorities of the government. Um, in the Gulf of Mexico, um, frankly, until Macondo, the view was the system worked great. Um, you've got a lot of companies. One of the things people don't understand, you keep hearing about Chevron and Exxon and Shell and BP, but there are a great many companies, medium-sized companies and independents. It's a very complex uh, kind of fabric of companies um, that have developed the Gulf of Mexico. And it frankly was extremely efficient, um, but whether it was properly regulated is another question. Um, you can see on the upper right-hand corner um, that um, in the UK, uh, Canada, Norway, and Australia, um, that uh, uh, the, the government has a very strong mandate. Approvals are pretty quick. They're not as quick as in the United States, um, but it, it's, it's fairly predictable. You can see as you get further away uh, from the uh, top right-hand box, uh, things either slow down um, or the government mandate is fairly weak. One of the points, though, to keep in mind on safety cases, this is complicated, and um, that the, the bureaucrats uh, or the politicians just can't uh, sign a piece of paper and shift a safety case. This will take a number of years to shift over. Um, so um, I think this is a, a way to go. I think it's a logic of to how to approach it, but it's complicated and it'll take time. Frank?
Thanks, Robin. Our next speaker is Magna Ogdendal. He's Director General of the Petroleum Safety Authority in Norway. Um, but his experience, starting with as a petroleum engineer, goes back to 1974. He's served as Director General since 2004, when the new safety authority was instituted. And to be quite uh, frank, uh, we actually scheduled the session around his availability because we thought it was so important to get his perspective. So, Director, would you please take your remarks. Well, thank you very much. And good morning, everybody. First of all, I would like to thank the organizer for inviting me to, to come and talk a little bit about the, what we do in Norway and how we do it. And I've been given 15 minutes to, to do it in. So I have to be kind of brief. But the, um, the petroleum history of Norway is around about 40 years. Started 68, 69 round about that, so it's a young sort of industry. The regulator at the time was compiled by giving tasks to existing regulators in Norway, like Civil Aviation Directorate, Coastal Directorate, etc., etc., etc. And uh, it was sort of a piecemeal setup, I would say, no proper coordination between uh, the uh, regulator at uh, that point in time. In um, 72, June 72, the, uh, the Norwegian Storting, the parliament, decided to establish a directorate, Norwegian Petroleum Directorate, and a national oil company, Statoil. That was a decision in 72. And the regulator started work April 73. And that agency, NPD, Norwegian Petroleum Directorate, was just one of several other directorates that uh, had uh, sort of been given task to overlook the petroleum industry. Offshore. Everything is offshore in Norway. Um, this system developed and uh, we in the NPD saw that what we were doing, the traditional way of going about things, you know, writing uh, prescriptive regulations, inspecting offshore, you went to one facility, wrote down 90 points that needed to be fixed, and then you went to the sister facility and you wrote a list of exactly the same 90 points, etc. It was a sort of a you didn't achieve much. And basically, what we concluded with uh, around about 78 was that we were doing the job that the industry should do. They should look at their own activity and not just sit back and wait for a regulator to come along and tell them what to fix. And then they just fixed it and waited for the regulator's next visit. It was a hopeless system we thought. So we started discussing what is the role of the regulator and what is the role of industry. And um, through that discussion with the companies, etc., we finally, after a year or two, agreed on what the regulatory role should be and what the industry role should be. We then they started talking about risk, not valves and all of this, but, uh, and pipe work, but uh, risk. We started to talk about risk, a risk approach. It's a risky business. What does risk really mean? Well, you have to deal with risk, just walking out here. You know, it's risky, there's traffic, all of this. So it's a, a risk approach uh, developed. And um, then uh, we had, uh, in the middle of all of these discussions, we had the, uh, the um, uh, Ecofisk uh, Bravo blowout, no people killed. Uh, we had the capsizing of a flotel, floating hotel, 123 people killed. And we had uh, several other very um, bad accidents. 
So, learning a little bit from uh, these accidents, the, the government decided in uh, 1985 to revamp the whole system, regulatory system. Introduced a new petroleum law, etc., etc., new regulations in, uh, gave a totally different new role to the Norwegian Petroleum Directorate and especially the safety part of it. And uh, it was sort of a tremendous shakeup. And uh, uh, in uh, 1985, we decided, because then the role of the NPD was totally different uh, to what it uh, had been, so we decided to go for a goal-setting regulatory regime or function, functional uh, requirements in the regulations. So uh, we worked with that through um, the years and ended up with a set of um, totally new set of regulations. And developing these regulations, uh, we did that uh, by uh, inviting industry in to participate in the discussions and also the labor unions were invited in. So it was a tri tripartite way of going about it and that's typical in Norway and um, came up with these uh, regulations. But then, after discussion, what is the role of the regulator? And what does a goal-setting regime require from a regulator? There was an obvious sort of answer to that. We couldn't use inspectors anymore. We had to, uh, to get uh, uh, totally different type of qualifications into the organization. And we couldn't use inspectors anymore. Because we shouldn't inspect. By inspecting, you are measuring to a large degree, and you are, as I said earlier, doing the job for the industry, that the industry should do themselves, etc. So the role discussion here, very, some very clear conclusions. And um, we therefore had to uh, get a, a new kind of uh, people into the uh, organization, a lot of training, uh, et cetera, et cetera, to be able to perform the function as a regulator based on the new way of thinking. And um, we should audit company management systems, right? And to be a good auditor, you need to be trained to be an auditor. Not the economic, not the money auditing, but the organization auditing and verifications. So audit and verification is the terminology we use, not inspection. This uh, system have, uh, has developed over the years. The um, regulations have been reworked as we gain experience, as we learn, for instance, if, we, uh, if there's something to learn from the catastrophe in the Gulf of Mexico here, we will of course take that learning and put it into the regulations or whatever is necessary to do, so we have to, have to learn. Safety case is mentioned here. And um, before I comment that a little bit, uh, uh, what is safety? Well, in the UK, they have one definition of what safety is. We have our definition of what safety is. And in Norway, yeah, I can put it like this, that uh, safety means prevention of harm to people, to the external environment, and to economic values. Those three elements. So if there's an unmanned facility, the two other issues are still relevant, right? So it's different from country to country. Uh, Lord Cullen recommended, they came out with 106 recommendations. And um, one of them, uh, we needed to, uh, to uh, do something about. The others, they, they were okay as we saw it. And um, this uh, recommendation that the uh, operator shall demonstrate that they can manage activity safely 
by describing it in a document, send it or give it to the regulator for um, approval. That was the recommendation, that it should be approved, this document. And um, after quite a bit of discussion, the, the term acceptance came into being. So a safety case is now accepted, not approved. We saw the danger in having all of these uh, documents landing on our desks in Norway. So uh, we have discussed that before, how much uh, information should be submitted to us for review and all of this kind of thing. So another new discussion, should we also require information in a document called safety case? And the decision was no, we will not do that because our people will be bogged down in paper and forget to look at what is actually happen happening in the industry. And that, we saw that in other countries happening. They couldn't leave the office because they had to do, go through these documents and accept them. So we have never asked for information to be compiled in a book like that. We asked the companies in the regulations, of course, to demonstrate and, uh, and write down how they do it, how they manage safety, how they do risk evaluations, analysis, and all of this stuff. So when we need it for a purpose, we ask them for it. Then there's a purpose behind us asking. So that is uh, basically our approach uh, to this. And um, looking back uh, in time, I think uh, it has functioned pretty well. We have challenges, yeah. We have to uh, do things uh, because the industry is evolving all the time. But at least we are not in the situation we were when we had prescriptive regulations, that these regulations were hindering te uh, new technology to be taken into use new and better technology. The regulator was always behind the development in the industry when it comes to writing regulations. And you could never catch up. And the maintenance load of it all to us, to just to maintain them and update them and so on, was a tremendous task. In the PSA, we are today, as a new organization, four or five years old, um, and it was decided to split it off from the NPD. It was a political reason for doing it, and probably it was to reduce political risk if something went wrong. But um, the, um, the uh, PSA uh, now then is only still only 160 people total. And I can't see any sign that uh, we will grow and that means that we have to do our job in a smarter way and evolve smarter ways of going about it as time goes on. Because the industry increases more and more facilities, pipelines, onshore facilities. So uh, that's, a, that's a big workload. But we, the challenge is for us to be smarter all the time. Thank you. There's a reason why we invite these people. So th th three things strike me, actually, four things, but I'll stay with the first three. It's scale, competition, and people, people skills. Um, I also have a question about liability, but I'll save that. So for our, both of our speakers, when you, Robin, you talked about the, the track record of the industry. So there's 4,000 deep water wells in the United States and the Gulf. There's 14,000 worldwide. When we went back and looked at the, the top 10 spills, and any spill is significant and disastrous, but of the top 10, six of the 10 were related to tankers. Um, one was a pipeline break in the Barents Sea, so that was seven. Uh, the two production facilities were Ixtoc, as you mentioned, and it took a long time to cap the well, and then Macondo, and then Iraq pulling out of, in Kuwait was obviously the biggest scale by orders of magnitude. So the track record actually has been pretty good, but there's a heightened sensitivity going forward in how we do that. 
In the U.S., it strikes me that, that competition, numbers of companies, bigger deals since the way we, that we lease tracks in the Gulf of Mexico. But it strikes me on the people skills piece, right? So if we're asked to um, have government regulators approve or accept or review systems that the companies put forward, that there has to be a basic trust that the companies are doing the right thing. And in this political environment, that's become extremely tricky, right? And then secondly, what's the role of the regulator in terms of shared liability if something goes wrong? Is there any empirical evidence that suggests one or another of these systems is better than an alternative system? Just some thoughts on that, and then we'll get started with questions. Uh, you asked a lot of questions, Frank. I know, that's um, what I do. The, um, um, I think that the, uh, uh, one of the things that was lost in sort of the hysteria around Macondo, and Macondo was a mess, uh, was the safety record. And basically, uh, that most oil in the water does not come from offshore operations. And that, um, I'm trying to remember, I should have brought the statistic. It's, it's, uh, um, We've produced 23 um, uh, billion barrels offshore uh, in the United States, and we have spilled something like 1,400 barrels. Uh, it's some incredible statistic. Um, that being said, um, Macondo happened. Something right. went wrong, and something was wrong. And as one dug into things, it was clear that in a number of cases, uh, some things were, were just uh, not up to standard. Um, I think that uh, the uh, that the U.S. offshore system um, uh, is, uh, um, you know, frankly, whether there is empirical evidence that one system was better than another, I think, is almost irrelevant at this point, because I think that what happened is that as the record became clear, and all I know is what I read in the newspapers. But what you read in the newspapers didn't give people much confidence, uh, and so clearly something has to change. Uh, okay. I think the public insists on it. Uh, and uh, so um, how are you going to change? And I think that uh, to me, as I say, the logic of safety case is that it shifts the burden and that to ask government to, um, again, if you have ever gone off one of these uh, rigs or platforms, uh, uh, you know, in, in greater than 5,000 feet of water, uh, I like to say it's as complicated as putting a man on the moon and then somebody pointed out, well, a man can actually walk on the moon. A man cannot walk at 5,000 feet of water. So it's even more complicated. And uh, I think we have to find uh, a new approach. One of the things that uh, Director Bromwich commented on was when he met with some of the other regulators, he was struck by the quality of the people and the resources they had available. And um, uh, one of the things I think that would be a serious mistake uh, is if we approach this as a sort of typical bureaucratic budgeting exercise. Um, I mean, a uh, point I tried to make is that there's you know, something like $100 billion is at stake here. And if we don't get it right, uh, it puts that at risk. Uh, and it would be a false economy to be uh, fiddling around about 10 or $20 million. Um, but I think also the role of everyone has to change. Um, and that, uh, again, the sort of the prescriptive approach it won't work. Now, where life gets complicated is the U.S. offshore system, um, as Frank pointed out, is very, very different than any other ones. And the number of independents and modest-sized companies changes everything. And there's a question of financial liability, but there's also um, how do independents meet certain standards um, that give the regulator confidence so the regulator can trust them. And I think that's, that's going to be a real challenge going forward, aside from just the financial liability issue. Um, but I, I think the fact of the matter is the public are going to insist something change. It has to change. And the question is, where do we go? Magna? <clears throat> yeah, uh, is one system better the, than another? Well, I think it's a, in, an impossible to answer that. Uh, a couple of things uh, that uh, I feel is important uh, when uh, designing a system, you know, a regulatory system, that is, what's the culture of the country? How does the, the country function? You know, what are the working life rules in the country? And that varies from country to country. So uh, any regulatory system, in my mind, has to fit 
what I just talked about, sure. the, the culture of the country. And uh, in Norway, for instance, we don't have uh, an auction system when it comes to licensing. Um, the government say here yeah, there are some blocks that we would like to offer. Those interested apply for a license. And they apply. The government uh, or the Ministry of Oil and Energy basically puts together the companies that will be in a license and they decide who the operator should be based on a, upon a proposal. In that system, it's possible to evaluate the competence of the licensees Change and the also the operator in a system like that. And to me, the decision who is going to be the operator is the most significant decision that is ever taken in the lifespan of a, of a license. Because as a regulator, you have to deal with the operator the next 20, 30, 40 years. So it's a crucial decision. In Norway too, as I mentioned, we have uh, strong unions, very competent people, mm -hmm. and uh, they are also uh, behind the safety delegates that are <coughs> offshore on the facilities. So the safety delegates have backing by the union, and thereby the safety delegates are, are strong. Okay. You can't fool about with them. Right, etc., etc. So it just illustrates, you know, that the working life rules of a country is very important when you design a system. Can you comment about the, the skill set of the people? Where do you draw your people from? Uh, basically, uh, uni university degrees. All our professional people have uh, a university master degree or something like that. A lot come out of industry retirees, or no? Well, uh, uh, we hire people from industry, and uh, industry hire people from us. <laughs> <laughs> so it works uh, both ways. We uh, know so uh, the the people we have uh, they uh, they come from uh, different types of industries, and uh, some also out of uh, academic, uh, yeah, world universities right. that sort of thing. So. Um, it's a, it's a, uh, the, the, um, the, the competence in the organization is very good. And therefore, dialogue with a competent operator is more or less on an equal basis, right? Okay. So, um, and that was one of the problems uh, with uh, what, what I had just called the uh, traditional inspector, you know, uh, to discuss a, a risk issue requires totally different competence than to uh, discuss an issue uh, related to a valve or right. a gauge or whatever. Right. Right. Thank you very much. Um, one of the reasons that we ask for participation of our audience is because it helps us learn as well. We have a couple of simple rules. Um, if you can identify yourself when speaking and asking a question, wait for the microphone um, is the second rule. The third one is to the extent that you can pose your question in the form of a question, that's always really helpful. So please, let's go ahead. David. Hi, David Goldwyn, uh, U.S. Department of State. Uh, we spent a lot of time giving advice to developing countries on how they should safely develop their oil and gas sectors. But Robin, I hear you saying, essentially in the U.S. we need civil service reform to be able to pay people at a scale that will be competitive with industry, and Norway has a very sophisticated academic and, and industry uh, complement of human resources to draw from. What system do you advise for the Liberia, Sierra Leone, Ghana, and other countries which have minimal pay scales and very thin capacity uh, for governance in general? Is it the safety case? Is it better compliance? Is it some different form of self-regulation? What, what advice should we give them? A couple points. A couple points. Um, the first is uh, that in the United States government, there are exceptional organizations uh, like the National Institute of Health, which has a different compensation program. Um, and I would argue that if you want to get the best, uh, you're going to have to pay them properly, and they're going to have to have those kinds of skills. And um, I think that uh, you're going to need the equivalent of brain surgeons to understand some of this stuff. Uh, this is very complicated and very sophisticated. So 
to the United States, I think that's one of the things to keep in mind. Um, um, I think that in terms of countries, again, uh, I couldn't agree more with Magda, and I tried to make the point on my chart. Part of it is how the, 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 the countries themselves work, just you were saying, what, what is the fabric, what are the role of labor unions, what is the competency of the government, you know, what is the educational level. Um, I think one of the things that uh, would be very helpful um, is if, um, frankly, uh, uh, there was a, um, um, uh, an international program that uh, some of the more advanced countries, such as the U.S., Norway, U.K., Australia, and Brazil, um, uh, provided uh, some services. Uh, I would point out that, uh, uh, you know, for example, countries, uh, small countries uh, have air traffic controllers, um, and they're competent. Well, the way they do it is they, it's all tied into a, a, a global system. Now, oil is very fundamental to the sovereignty of countries, and they're not going to give up their sovereignty. Um, but I think by the same token, uh, to create a pool and some standards. Um, the other thing, of course, is that national oil companies are, those of us who've been in this racket, uh, they're, completely, they're completely different animals, uh, and they're very unlikely to give up any of their sovereignty. Um, so how do you make it easy for people? To understand, um, and how do you make it clear what best practices are? There's an organization of regulators, uh, but I think that what you need to do is to start getting companies and service companies. One of the things that's happening in the industry is there's a lot of local content, um, and you'll see that they're, particularly in shallow water, uh, indigenous drilling companies, and boat companies, and a number of different service companies that just don't operate at global standards. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, is that the oceans, particularly, um, um, you know, this, this, they're really one massive ecosystem, um, and it would make sense to have some kind of, they may be voluntary, uh, but uniform standards and make it easy for them to do it. Other questions? Go ahead. We have a microphone coming. Sorry, Ken Friedman, U.S. Department of Energy. How much dialogue do you have with other uh, countries in Europe relative to this issue? And also, how do you measure your success? I mean, given the history, you can go five years, ten years, and not have a, a major incident. Does that mean you've been successful? Do you have other ways of measuring it? Thank you. We, uh, we uh, have a very good uh, dialogue with uh, our fellow regulators in Europe. So we have um, a group uh, called uh, NSOAF, North Sea Offshore Authorities Forum. And uh, we also have um, a group of regulators called uh, the International Regulators Forum. And uh, in IRF, uh, the US, with the former uh, BOEM, is uh, with us there, Brazil, Australia, um, yeah, two or three uh, countries in Europe, etc. So it's more an international group. So uh, we work, uh, we have uh, initiated work, uh, there are working groups, uh, uh, working on uh, different issues, both in Europe, NSOF, but also in IRF. We uh, recently organized uh, an IRF conference in uh, Vancouver. And uh, there are, of course, the two blowouts um, uh, were on the agenda, etc. So um, uh, the, uh, the uh, cooperation between regulators, that, uh, that is getting better all the time, I would say. And it's, it's necessary, because typically the, the regulator sits in his or her corner in a country while the industry is international and they have sort of uh, groups, you know, oil and, um, OGP, you know, all of these organizations. So the uh, regulator needs to get organized a little bit along the same lines. Therefore, these uh, two uh, groups are mentioned. Okay. Is? Success. How do you measure success? Oh, yeah. Uh, I said we are risk-based, right? So uh, what is our goal in life? Is to reduce risk. 
And uh, how do we know if we uh, manage together with industry to reduce risk? Well, we have to measure the risk picture in the industry. And we do that. And um, together with the industry and again the unions, we develop a yearly report painting the, uh, the risk picture in the Norwegian industry. And there, based on trends, you can see how the risk is moving for certain uh, elements, up, down, or whatever. And uh, it's easy to, uh, to initiate action when you have a negative risk trend in an area. Uh, so that's the way we do it. And, uh, but again, it's resource demanding, it's very sophisticated methodology, it's no easy thing to do. But uh, this report um, uh, is that we publish. It's public. You'll find it on our website. Um, it's public, but that's on the industry level. The companies can go in and look at company level, and, uh, we, and we can, of course, too. And we can also uh, look at the platform level. So you break it uh, all the way down. But uh, what we produce and make public, that is the industry picture, not the rest. But we use the rest to put priority, where should we uh, use our resources, what should we look at, who should we talk to, all of this. So it's a very a good document for us when we put priority to, uh, to issues. We can't do everything, we have to prioritize. So it helps us uh, a lot in that. And thereby, you also get information about uh, are you successful or not. Um, we had a, a negative development in hydrocarbon re releases, gas releases. And gas, free gas, is a dangerous uh, thing. It should be inside pipes and vessels and all of this, not on the outside. So we had a lot of uh, negative development. And then pointed this out uh, to industry and said, look at this. This is unacceptable, this uh, development there. Who is the problem owner? That's the industry. The industry, you have to fix this problem. And uh, they did, started a project, and uh, uh, we set up a um, 50% uh, reduction in three years, and uh, industry achieved it. So then we suggested to industry, why not another 50% in uh, three years? And they managed to, uh, to do that in two years, actually, but the third year, it was high up again. So, that illustrates it needs continuous attention. Excuse me, my sense also that, again, with sort of the concept of safety case, of, of the burden shifting the countries, uh, companies for um, continuous improvement. And, and if there's a, a lesson that can be learned somewhere else, um, and it can be applied. I mean, that's, it's a, as I say, it, that's very different than the prescriptive, just check the box. Um, and uh, uh, the, the companies themselves are very used to the concept of continuous improvement, of how do you make things more efficient and say, I mean, that's the way they think. Governments don't think that way, and this, or they don't, in the past, haven't thought this way, and this is a way to shift it around. I think uh, for, for me, as a regulator, there are two key words and you just mentioned them. It's prevention and it's improvement. Those are the two key words. Okay. You both alluded to the Arctic. It's a special set of circumstances given the length of the drilling season, the ice, the ecological and environmental conditions. Is there a separate approach or, or a thought that you would give to that or experience you've had with that? Yeah, uh, the activity in Norway is moving north, right. but not into ice. Okay. Yet, so um, so, uh, but uh, it's colder, it's dark, all of this. So uh, what one is looking at now is uh, evaluate uh, standards that are that are being used you know, for steel or whatever. Mm -hmm. Can they take the temperature, etc., etc. And uh, also protective clothing for the workers. You know all of these uh, more soft issues that comes along with darkness okay. and and uh, cold weather. So all of that is being uh, looked at now. The basic regulations 
will not change. Right. Because they are functional. So they are just uh, as well, and they are risk based, right? Mm -hmm. So um, you don't need to change the regulations, but you, you may have to do changes to uh, supporting documentation like codes and standards and guidelines and that sort of thing. Okay. But the formal framework, you don't need to change. Robin? Uh, I think there's a feeling uh, the, the, you have the sort of uh, uh, offshore and Arctic waters, uh, which is sort of the Norwegian case. And then you get the true high Arctic above the Arctic Circle, um, Beaufort Sea kind of thing. Um, and that's really very different. And I think there's, um, there's first the question of, 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 of drilling activity and how disruptive uh, mm -hmm. it is to migration uh, routes of, of uh, bowhead whales and things like this. Um, and what, what kind of damage, which is really not well understood. The second thing you then have is um, uh, uh, the prevention of spills. Uh, but then you get into um, uh, also then the area of uh, spill containment and cleanup and um, what it would be like uh, cleaning up a spill uh, in right. negative right. 40 degrees when it's dark 24 hours a day and people can't go outside more than 15 minutes. Uh, I don't know how you do that. Um, obviously, you just prevent it, uh, but it's, uh, so I think the challenges, as I say, for the sci Arctic are um, um, uh, the, the burden on the companies will be very high. And I know that some companies are very sensitive to this, they want to proceed, and they're spending uh, a lot of time and money and thought to be able to anticipate these. But I think that the, the, the challenge is seen as really on a different order of magnitude. Okay. Thank you. Bruce Everett, Georgetown University. <clears throat> uh, Robin touched on the airline industry, and it seems to me that um, we have a pretty good regulatory st structure for the airline industry with high degree of government expertise, strong industry government cooperation, very international cooperation. Do our speakers think that that's a possible model for the U.S. to use for offshore regulation? Uh, I. I I think the challenge so far is that, that uh, people have got to stop kind of pointing fingers at each other uh, and get to what it is they really want to try and achieve. Uh, and um, the one thing about the airline industry is that planes literally take off in one country and land in another or cross through it. Um, so it's, it's a, a different kind of uh, um, an approach. But I think that we've got to take a more sophisticated approach. And I think that the first thing that politicians and policy makers have to do is figure out what it is they really want to achieve. Um, and they haven't figured that out. Uh, and I think to change the, the system, I know some high-powered lawyers here this morning, that if you start changing the system, we have a very prescriptive system in everything. Uh, and to change the legal system in offshore oil, which gets into lots of different other laws, is very complicated. Uh, and. Um, but I think, uh, I just, I don't see how you can regulate any advanced industry now, uh, given a prescriptive system where people check the boxes. I just don't, and I don't care what it is. Um, and somehow we've got to change it. And I would argue that, uh, that the offshore industry, given the experience of places like Norway, which have been uh, relatively successful, uh, and there's a real logic to it, and it, it, it harnesses the enormous ability of these companies. Again, I cannot emphasize, for those of you, if you have a chance, go see the scale of this thing in the Gulf of Mexico. It's really almost unbelievable. Um, and how do you get that working for you rather than against you? It's, it's, it's got to be collegial. It's got to be sort of a team approach. It can't be adversarial. Um, whether the airline industry, I, I don't know enough about the airline. There are other people who know more about the airline <laughs> industry than I do. I can't say. Robert, come on up here. Thank you. Um, so I'm Robert Grant from the British Embassy here in Washington. Um, clearly, the prescriptive approach hasn't got a particularly good uh, reputation um, amongst you two gentlemen. And um, my my question really is is um, if the U.S. is going to move in direction closer to the U.K. and and, and to Norway. Um, 
for the various reasons that you've outlined, because of the technology, because of the capacity and the, the regulators um, to actually inspect in a way that was perhaps the case previously. Um, how how you, you're actually going to do that? I mean, despite the fact that you two gentlemen seem to think that a, a prescriptive regulatory approach is, um, is, is not ideal, um, clearly the culture here is, is somewhat different. You just have, exactly as you, you just described, um, the the attitude towards companies, towards the oil industry, particularly you know, since Macondo, is, is, is not particularly positive. I think we should probably just say that. Um, but you said more broadly that, um, that industry in general are, are treated as a body that needs to be, to be watched and observed and, and, and held to account. So I, I just wonder if, assuming one does agree that a prescriptive approach is perhaps not the most ideal approach and that we could do better perhaps by moving to something closer to what is done in Norway, um, and, and in the North Sea, how, how on earth do you get there and how you bring the people along with you? Thanks. If I may make a suggestion, wait a I would take a safety case approach to this. And I would uh, go back to, uh, the fact of the matter is that the, the biggest operators in the Gulf of Mexico are uh, Shell and BP uh, and Chevron and Anadarko. Uh, they all operate under safety case. Um, and, um, they, uh, you start with the number of companies that know how to work with safety kits. Uh, and if you went to them and said, okay, uh, how do we make this work? Just to, I mean, to shift the burden rather than, again, people writing things, sit down with the company and say, how do we make this work? We, there are a couple of things we want to achieve as policymakers, and then the companies how to do it. I, I think if you, uh, again, uh, if you leave it to the bureaucrats to write something out the size of the New York City telephone book, um, I think you know what you're going to get. Uh, which I don't really think in the end is going to solve the problem. Does that make sense? Uh, again, a, a, co a couple of factors that uh, I think uh, is uh, very important to evaluate, because one has to evaluate, as I indicated earlier, what is the smart move to make. So uh, first of all, what's around us, right? Well, we have the petroleum industry. I don't know too much about the petroleum industry in, um, in uh, the US, in the Gulf, but I, I hear there are many small operators there. So there may be a competence issue, maybe a capacity issue with the companies that needs to be looked at, etc., etc. So uh, to, uh, to, uh, uh, to get a good understanding of, uh, of um, uh, what what the industry is all about, and, uh, and then uh, ask uh, the question, what is the smart way for, for a regulator in the US, not in Norway, but in the US, to go about regulating this kind of industry that uh, has a tremendous span, possibly competence-wide, and uh, all of this. It's, um, there's, a, there's no easy solution to this. Because if one selects one model, uh, safety case, then one has to look, before decision is made, one has to define what competence the regulator have to have in order to be able to operate such a system. And also, the industry, what they, the industry must have competence in this. They must understand the risk approach. And uh, many companies don't do that. They don't understand a, a formal, say, good risk approach. So um, there, there's a lot of issues and questions. And um, I think a, a thorough discussion around these uh, things before any decision is made, I think it's vital that one does, uh, do that. Point briefly is that our system of advocacy in the American petroleum system um, is a kind of lowest common denominator. Um, and uh, I don't think that's going to be acceptable this time around. And I think one of the real challenges is going to be for independent companies uh, to be able to demonstrate, just your point, that they're capable, or to find a system, a collective system, um, uh, as on liability issues, um, so that um, they can participate. And from our standpoint in the Gulf, as we look at it, we've modeled the Gulf and everything like this, um, the independents play a very important role in developing this. 
Yeah, and just, Robert, to put it in, in context, too, uh, you have a specific perspective from the UK on this specific instance. Um, it struck me that, that one of the things that, that did happen over the course of time over the last six months, right, so there was a range of legally compliant um, uh, guidelines for well-designed equipment use, operational standards, that kind of stuff. That's been compressed now to down to kind of best practices. Would you agree with that? And I actually think the collaboration, so once the president made the decision earlier in the spring to continue with the offshore development, it was in part based on, as Robin said, the need for, this is 1.6 million barrels a day, right? So it's jobs, it's the economy, it's national security, it's homegrown resources, right? I can tell you from conversations that we've had that the White House was both surprised and annoyed, if that's the right word, um, that 30 days after that we had a spill of this magnitude after being assured that it was relatively safe, the track record historically was great, and oh, if this happened, we knew how to deal with it. Right? So then there's this kind of learning curve and the pendulum swung back. My sense is that over the course of the summer, that the collaboration, and it started out being very confrontational, but the collaboration, whether it was with Exxon or Shell or Schlumberger or Chevron, uh, in addition to BP, there was a lot of discussion at Interior, at the White House, and a number of different places about how the best ways to approach this. And I think there's a newfound respect on both sides. Now, sorting that out in the political process, setting out the liability, that's going to be a way forward that we're going to have to figure out. But this notion of demonizing industry, whether it's the financial industry or the oil industry, you know, or the insurance companies, we've got to figure out a way to do that better over the next two years or we've got nothing going forward. Um, I, I will come back to that thought about the election. Go ahead. Go ahead. Sally Kornfeld, Department of Energy. Um, I have a question regarding the applications that come in in Norway. And um, I know that, that you accept them rather than approve them. But how do you work to make sure that the, that paperwork that doesn't become a phone book and doesn't become something that is just regurgitated as boilerplate, but actually is meaningful to improve safety as you go forward, that each one is really looked at at a risk basis um, and takes in appropriate uh, considerations. We, uh, we uh, operate a consensus. And uh, that means that um, uh, companies that, uh, that want, uh, for instance, to, uh, to drill um, exploratory well, they have to apply for consent to do so. And um, we say yes or no to, to that application, uh, basically. It's, no, it's nothing uh, to do with approval or anything like that, but uh, through the application, they demonstrate to us that they are capable of doing the job safely. So we say yes. I can't tell you. But the content. No way. Uh, the, the example I took, uh, exploration well, they, uh, they, they have to refer to the rig they are going to use. And uh, the uh, uh, rig contractor has to have uh, from us an, uh, an AOC, as it's called, that is acknowledgement of compliance, that the rig complies with Norwegian regulations and that the crew uh, on board are competent and all of this stuff. So that AOC system uh, is uh, valid for all, say, floating rigs that are flagged in a ship register somewhere. So that's a system uh, that we operate. And it's a very thorough system because the drilling contractors in Norway, they uh, did not uh, understand the regulations properly a lot of difficulties with that. So the, uh, the, um, uh, the uh, decision was made to go for an AOC system. It's not a safety case system. It's uh, much wider in scope. It has all working environment issues, noise, what have you, living quarter facilities, all of it in there. Then in the consent application, the, uh, the operator then refers to the rig he's going to use demonstrate to us that the, the rig is capable to do the job 
okay. that is planned to do, that the work scope for the rig, you know, water depth, loads, what have you, all of that is within the envelope of the rig. And then, of course, uh, come up with or uh, uh, the inform us how the well will be drilled, the design of the well, <coughs> etc. And um, we say yes or no to this. And uh, we have different types of consents at milestones in the industry activity. So, for instance, to take a facility into use, mm -hmm. uh, build a new one, take it into use offshore, requires a consent. Uh, this consent system then uh, gives us the, uh, the um, uh, ability to work with the word prevent. Okay. And uh, now we have a lot of new, uh, smaller companies in Norway too. Some of them are brand new. They hardly have any experience. Brand new. And uh, we, as a regulator, from a safety point of view, has uh, have now had to say no to consent applications from such companies because we have uh, decided after studying the companies and uh, all of this that they are not competent and they do not have necessary capacity to, to handle the job. Okay. So that's a new situation for us. We have never been uh, uh, earlier use those arguments to say no. Okay. But you, from a prevention point of view, we can't just can't take the risk. Right. So therefore, it's no. So when you talk about um, competency and ability, does that extend also to liability in the event that there were something no, to occur? We, uh, we uh, do not look at liability if you uh, mean economics. Okay. We don't look at that. that uh, that's another ministry that looks at uh, those issues. Okay, fair enough, Bob. Lou Watts, ex-PFC Energy. Um, I want to say something about culture and then ask uh, a separate but linked question to both of the speakers. Um, I sit on the board of a, the largest crisis management company in Europe. Since the Macondo spill, almost all the requests we've had for audit and assurance have come in from boards of directors, investors, and in the insurance industry. And when we go in and look at these, and it's not just in the oil industry, the single thing that you can pick up which is common across all is problems with culture. Now, I'll tell you a little story, and I'll, you'll see why I'm asking this question. I worked for 25 years for a super major. I actually worked in Norway. And Norway is, in my experience, unique in as much as that there's total respect between the operator and the service industry. And I'm going to ask a question about that in a moment. I had the misfortune to manage one of the biggest blowouts, which is not on Robin's list in Nigeria. We lost 18 people in 1990, so you can add that to the list as well. What was one of the major problems? Culture. I've also worked in the service industry, and when I went across to the service industry, I was absolutely horrified in the way that the majors and the operators treated the service industry. And it made me reflect on my career, and Robin knows this, I hang my head in shame the way I treated the service industry. So my question is this, and by the way, the reason this is important, you can have the best safety case in the world, but what actually happens with an incident on the rig is down to individuals. So my question to Magna is, first of all, good dog, um, is what is unique about Norway that allows that to happen? And my question to Robin is, in the context of what we're discussing, and the US is one of the worst countries for this, what needs to change from a cultural point of view? It's a challenging word, and uh, certainly, as I've indicated, uh, you know, there are differences in, uh, in culture. Um, back in uh, the 1980s, uh, based on the uh, prescriptive approach, there was sort of no trust between us as a regulator and the industry. There were sort of arguing 
trying to, uh, to uh, well, that were clashes, right? Hard words, that sort of thing. So uh, that uh, did not facilitate uh, improvement, discussion around how can we together go about changing things in order to improve. It was, a, uh, as I indicated uh, in my little talk, it was a very difficult, hopeless situation and it needed to change. So, therefore, we certainly, uh, uh, based on this uh, discussion, the role, was the role of the regulator, was the role of industry. After clarifying that and agreeing on a role description, um, we were able to start working together because it was obvious at the time if we as a regulator are going to be achieve our goal namely to improve continuously improve safety in Norwegian waters we need to have the industry along because we can't do it as a regulator we are not out there managing safety every day that's the industry that does that. So, to, just to rec recognize this, that uh, we as a regulator, totally de dependent upon the industry and all participants in the industry, not just the operator, the drilling contractors, service companies, all of them. And of course, all of these have their very important role in the industry. And that role should be respected fully and they also have uh, duties, the individual uh, participants of a service company have duties that they have to take on board. They are put in the regulations applicable to them, etc. So, uh, uh, at least we um, ended up with that we need to start afresh and we started based on this role discussion to change the working relationship between ourselves and industry and within industry. Right. And a simple thing, why is it so that a contractor, uh, a person working for a contractor, shall have the, the worst room in the living quarters? Because uh, he is employed by a contractor. You know, situations like that uh, goes back to mutual respect for the different parties, all of this, and uh, create a working relationship. Because basically, uh, industry is not in the industry for safety reasons. They are operating a business. But when it comes to safety in that business, the goal of industry and the goal of the regulator are more or less overlapping. Because an accident like we have seen here in the States now, it's so expensive. Mm -hmm. It's a company of reputation, you know, uh, all of this, you know, makes a company to, I hope, to do its best to be the best safety company in the world. So. If we can recognize this uh, together, the uh, regulator, the industry, work together, etc. And uh, in our case, also with the worker unions and safety delegates, everybody is on board. That is, uh, is a situation that we have in Norway to a large extent. We disagree, oh yeah, we are not uh, agreeing on everything. But we, at least we work together. Um, Lou, I, I, I think your point's a very, very good one. Um, one of the big differences between Norway and a lot of other places is one, uh, going back to Magna's earlier comment of how a society functions, it's a very high consensus society. Secondly, it's a very high cost operating environment. So, you know, frankly, if you have more costs related to safety, the government ends up paying for a lot of it. And third, you have very powerful labor unions and the offshore, and they insist on safety for obvious reasons. And the offshore in the United States isn't organized at all. So you have something really, the sort of cultural structures unique in Norway. I think that um, your point is very well taken. 
that the, the relationship between the operators and the service companies is very adversarial. The discussion is generally just about cost and safety costs, and people don't want to bother uh, with it. And uh, obviously that's unacceptable. Um, I think one of the virtues of safety case is that the, the operator and the contractors are meant to be all in this together and they are meant to collectively have anticipated the problems. Whereas in the current system, it's just the operator. The operator uh, 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 you know, provides the environmental impact statements and things like that. And so if you make it collective, so if the drilling companies and everybody um, uh, are in it together, and it's not you and it's not us versus them, it's we're all in this, it's us together. Uh, but I think the system is, uh, the way it's structured now, I mean, has, has led to a lot of it. I think it's deeply flawed. Makes us all think about low-cost bidders. Uh, Nate, you had a question. Uh, Nate Titai from Statoil. Uh, just a question with regard to, you know, assuming, or if we do move in a safety case direction, Robin, um, there are also a lot of structural differences between Norway and the U.S., for example. The governing laws, for example, the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act and other implementing laws, th there, it takes a less holistic approach than the Norwegian laws with respect to, from the, as uh, Magna referred to, the leasing rounds. And, and it's a very much, uh, they put the burden on the operators to explain how they're going to develop fields and projects. And in the U.S., it's, it's a very money-based system, how you're awarded a lease. Um, so there seem to be some uh, procedures and processes before you even get to a safety case that you that you either could choose to revisit or do they make sense given a safety case type of environment? Um, they, they it's kind of like putting a you know round peg through a square hole. Will this fit in that in this type of environment given the structural uh, kind of dynamics the U.S. already has? Because those would have to be revisited in a political process by Congress potentially, and we all know how that could potentially go. Um, I, I think that the, uh, for, this really isn't that complicated an issue for larger companies because they operate under safety case around the world. They have track records. I think where life gets really interesting is with the independence and that a system has to be found for the independence to be able to either singly or collectively, and I honestly believe it's going to be a collective answer. Otherwise, these companies just can't afford it. Um, of, of ways to deal with a number of these issues. Uh, but I th as I say, the, um, uh, the majors know how to operate under this, and I, I don't think it's that complicated, but it's, it's for companies that this is something new. And, and you have some independents they are very, very smart people. They went to Wall Street, they raised a couple billion dollars and went out and got some leases. And, and I assume the lady who does health, safety, and environment also does the quarterly earnings releases and hands out parking permits. Um, you know, the 30 people in the company. Um, and they, uh, you know, buy the seismic data from Schlumberger, they do this, this, there's no, it's a virtual company. But when there's a spill, again, say what you like about BP, but the resources that BP put into this thing are just uh, almost unimaginable. Uh, and so uh, somehow the independents have got to be able to respond to this. Okay, since this is a political town and we're still suffering through the aftermath of last week's activity, you want to comment about the impact of the election? Magna, I will give you a pass on this unless you want to weigh in on the <laughs> politics of Washington. But. Go ahead. Um, I, I think that the, um, um, with the Republicans getting the House and Democratic leverage reduced in the Senate, um, I think the, the chances of a um, uh, sweeping overhaul in Congress anytime soon are highly unlikely. Um, and I think the whole game is going to shift to the administrative side of the House, um, particularly at uh, Interior um, and EPA. But there are a lot of agencies involved in this that you'd be surprised. Um, but I, I would argue that, that um, what would be very helpful if all of the agencies had a consistent theory of management of the offshore. So there's a real logic to what they're doing. Otherwise, you could have OSHA going in one direction, people going in all these different directions. And um, that um, just because you've lifted a moratorium doesn't mean drilling activity will start. And all you need is one administrative agency to say no, and that's a moratorium. 
Um, and so I think uh, there's a real challenge to the administration, and it's going to require some real leadership because uh, different organizations have different imperatives. But uh, if you want to get this going, and this is the point I tried to make right at the beginning, this is a big deal. There is real money here, a lot of money. And uh, that, uh, frankly, if this, um, uh, if this industry is permitted to founder, um, it'll be a, um, you know, there'll be hundreds of thousands of high paying jobs at risk, which in 2012, um, I don't, I wouldn't want to be responsible for losing those jobs. Uh, we've been doing this for quite a while. I, let me just tell you, I, this has been one of the more substantive discussions, and it's in part because of your thoughtful questions and in part because of our excellent selection of speakers. Made so, by you. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, there was Lee and Lisa and Max and Scott and others. Um, let me just take one final question, then I have just one comment to make. Go ahead, please. Yes, I'm, I'm Pete Johnson with the National Academy of Engineering, and I would just like to ask the speakers to address the, the subject of uh, creeping risk that comes into operations such as the Macondo well problem, because I think uh, both, both speakers have, have mentioned the, the, the good record of the oil industry in the Gulf, but the good record of the oil industry in the Gulf was, is sort of based on much less risky operations in the past. And as we get into deeper and deeper water, we're, we're reaching the limits of some of the technologies. And we have to anticipate that risk rather than go back to saying how good we did in the past. And some examples of this are that I, I noticed in Norway that uh, there is some organizations that have evaluated deep uh, offshore blowouts on a on a worldwide basis, looked at the North Sea, looked at the Gulf of Mexico, and, and there are good indicators there about what kind of risky operations we need to look out for. And, uh, you know, and, and Mac the Macondo well operations was just on the edge of that, but nobody really recognized it because nobody paid much attention to these looks at, at past indicators. And, and and those past indicators were available. They, you know, they were out there. Everyone had them, but, but no one paid much attention to them. So I, I wonder how any kind of a safety case or whatever kind of regulator can, can pay attention to this problem of, as, as we get into more and more risky operations, how to identify the future risks rather than base it on the past, uh, past operations. Can I uh, try this? The trick in this is don't have the government try and anticipate future risks. Get the companies to anticipate future risks. Um, be, um, well, but we had a system which didn't encourage them to do that. I mean, if you checked the box, you were okay. Uh, and uh, clearly that can't work in the future. Uh, and, and it's, if the, the uh, to me, the fundamental problem was that the the money, the technology that went into exploration and production. Believe me, every possible advance, every possible risk to the success of those operations was thought through very, very carefully. Safety was the area that people said, oh, the record's okay, don't worry, we know how to do it. People were sure to do it, and they really hadn't. And what you need is the same level of care and preparation and thought to go into the safety side of the house that goes into the sort of business side of the house. Every business, whether you're making jelly donuts uh, or whatever, there's always a tension between production and safety. Um, and I think, frankly, the, it became very heavily weighted on the production side and the safety side. Um, you know, when they were using straw and uh, stockings and golf balls, um, clearly we weren't at the state of the art here. Um, and frankly, in nine months, the, the level of learning went up enormously. Um, and so, uh, anyway, that, that would be my comment. Yeah, I think uh, uh, the risk um, you were talking about, uh, that, is, that is a risk that needs to be managed by the, the companies that are exposed to the risk. And, uh, but to be able to do that, they need to know about it, that it is there. 
And that uh, could be a role for a regulator to ask a question. Uh, there's a risk here. It looks like this. How are you managing that? And who is managing that? Who has the competence? And if you get into a more sort of cultural area, that is very difficult, you, uh, you know, to dig into. And it's, uh, it's challenging, and therefore you need um, um, well-qualified people, both in the, the uh, operating company and contractors, if that is relevant, but also uh, in the regulators' organization. Because the most important thing a regulator also can do is ask questions. Not give answers, but ask questions. Have you thought about so-and-so? Have you studied so-and-so? Do you know the technical condition of your separators? How do you know them? Etc. You ask questions. You don't say, you do so, you do so, because as a regulator, you are not an uh, expert in operating petroleum facilities. That's, that's why we have uh, companies. They should be expert uh, in this. And therefore, competence, capacity, and all of these questions are so very important. But talking about risk, just uh, one final yeah. comment uh, from me is that uh, the bow tie uh, you showed on the board here. If there is one regulator that deals with the left-hand side of the bow tie, right. that is of tremendous help yeah. when approaching the issues from a risk point of view. Yeah, absolutely agree. So we all share slightly different perspectives on this, and I take your point. Um, we were one of the largest operators in the Gulf. I was with Pennzoil for 20 years, and our track record was pretty good, I would argue, with the number of wells. It's not that companies didn't know that deeper wells and more difficult wells and high-pressure wells bring different risks. It's your approach. And, and my earlier point about compacting down what was legally compliant to a set of uh, uh, best practices that are now more narrowly defined, I actually think one of the holes in this whole thing, there were a lot of gaps exposed by Macondo, right? But one of them was on containment and capture that because the track record and maybe the overconfidence with things like blowout prevention were so significant that a lot of the things that we saw on the surface, whether it was uh, burning or you know booms um, or skimming uh, to that extent, that these are really kind of 1980s that have moved a little bit because we haven't had to deal with that. I, I think the industry, as Robin said, has, has learned tremendously, but more importantly, has applied what they've known over the last six or eight months to increase that capability. So we still have things to learn, things will continue to change, but, but it's how to mesh up the regulator with the operator. Frank, the only thing I would say is... That was 1979. Yes, and the, so in 30 years we learned nothing from that because, you know, the, the biggest problem with Exoc was that it kept flowing for 10 months and nobody knew how much was flowing, but it flowed at the rate of, you know, many thousands of, of uh, barrels a day. But, but the problem with Exoc was that there was no containment system that worked. And the exact same problem with, with Macondo with there's no containment system that, that worked for a long time. Yeah, so I think the difference is, right, so that over the 30-year period, prevention and operational safety got better, but if the holes in the cheese yeah. were to be aligned, you're right. This right. is the yeah. containment and capture didn't work. The success on relief wells is 100%, right? So the fact that it takes three months um, is not acceptable, and I think that's one of the things that's being worked on to get a more expedited view, but the left side of the bow tie is the prevention side. Uh, better well design, anticipating a, a wider range of instances where things could go wrong, and then having the capability to respond, to do sub intervention at this point. So uh, on one side, this is a bias here, but on one side you might say that, so you saw the vision of the flowing well for 90 days. That was extraordinary that you even saw that. But the fact that you can actually intervene a mile down with that temperature and that pressure now using remotely operated vehicles 
um, with handhold controllers to do what they do. We still need to improve, but things have moved a lot since XDOC, I would argue. So um, let me thank you all for two things. I, there was a number of people that actually showed up at CSIS that obviously didn't read, but you all did. So thank you much for <laughs> paying attention to that. Uh, thank you for joining us for this series because it's been a learning experience for all of us. And please join me in thanking our speakers. This has been terrific. <laughs>